Narak, I think it's safe to say it was a combination of the three of you. Welcome in, everybody. Derby, I think Narak was here before you. Just saying. Also, why is my mic so low? Let's fix that. Sound resume. Microphone activated. So you're like 20 minutes before stream started? Fair enough. <laughs> Jay, you're not wrong. Yeah, it was absolutely you with the goddamn behemoth. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I don't know why my microphone is so low in OBS. Couldn't tell you. You sounded fine on my end earlier. I would have said something otherwise. Yeah. I thought it, because Windows has been changing my microphone volume oh, randomly, God. I thought it was that. Is it any better? always Windows. Well, now I'm in the yellow. Is it any better? Yep, that's better. Okay. I just... Increase the gain a little bit. Welcome in, everybody, to our Chapter 2 recap. I'd be in there right now, but all you hear is Jeff Dunham in the background. <laughs> oh, God. Why? <laughs> That's all I have to say. Why? <laughs> My hair is all weird. Anyways. <laughs> As I'm watching Jeff Dunham, fair enough. But, yeah, welcome to the chapter two recap of our Erosia campaign. Um, yours truly will be reading out most of it, but then Jet's gonna kick in for some parts because notes. <laughs> Let's be honest, chapter two was like the best that this game has been. You can go ahead and say that. <laughs> it's true. It, it it has not gotten as good as Chapter 2 yet. The Tale of Suspense, Bahir is in many hamstrings. <laughs> yeah. 36? 36 hamstrings? I didn't even bother I think, mentioning that. I'd, there I think it was 36. While I was writing up the recap where I was just like, I want to be done writing this, <laughs> and we'll just discuss the bullshit right. after. I mean, that's what we did last time. Oh, yeah, I gotta show you. Uh, what? I don't know what she is barking at. Oh, if you can see my shirt. <laughs> I have my D&D &D shirt on. Nice. <laughs> what? You want to go see what's out there? I don't, I don't think it's anything. No, you're half asleep over there. She's like, look, look at, she's like, she's like, no, I'm not going out there. Case in point, never let Chris roll die to decide the victim total. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Borf, yep, yeah, Borf is asleep. He's on the bed. Okay, shall we get started then? <laughs> as long as my dog decides not to interrupt me again. Yeah, I'm good whenever. I... Chapter 2 With Melfiore dead, the party spent several days recovering from their fight. They had begun just a few short months, but the resistance had changed drastically. What had been a dozen or so rebels when they left had become several hundred. Most of these were civilians, displaced by the destruction of Ruska and Tavali, but the beginnings of an army were becoming clear. With a member of their leadership stuck in stasis, the party sat sit with Cass and Shock discussing how to move forward. Shock speaks of the myth of the Ascendant, an ancient mystic from the old Phoenix clans, and rumors, twenty years old by now, Still circulate in the capital city of Eladrin, Tarsh. With no other options and no further leads, the party is sent forth to find Saren, the last of the Phoenix. Six days of travel bring the party to the outskirts of Eladrin, 
and the party finds the capital occupied by LSF's forces. Sneaking in, through their various tricks of deception, they walk the... Coming. User joined your channel. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello. I saw you were playing Cyberpunk and I didn't want to bother you. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> yeah. bad. I've, uh, don't worry about it. I've been playing Cyberpunk for the last 40 hours. Damn, son. <laughs> Have not, any uh, not seizures? Straight. Nope. <laughs> I am not epile 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 epileptic, though, so I've got that going for me. 40 hours. Not not straight, but I am currently at 40 hours played. This sounds like my own cyberpunk playtime. I don't have cyberpunk, so... After everything I've heard about Cyberpunk, I have no intention of getting it until, like, patch 40. Right. Unless someone it's, gives it to me, and even then yeah. I'm not playing it until it, patch 40. It sounds a little yikes right now. It, it, we, we can discuss that after. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's fine. <laughs> um, I'm gonna Look, let's be real. We're actually playing Tangent with a side of D&D. It's, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's just what this entire campaign has been. It's it's very true. That is what this entire campaign has been. But... Can I can I real talk though with yeah, go ahead. a majority of us all kind of sitting in the general vicinity of each other in voice chat? Um yeah. I don't care up until this point, but the final fight is going to need to not be that. Because I already expect the final fight to be upwards of eight hours. Wow. Between all of the roleplay and everything. So, just spoilers. I'm working on that right now, and it's a little bit intense. Fair enough. Okay. Let's start that paragraph over. <laughs> Six days of travel bring the party to the outskirts of Eladrin, and the party finds the capital occupied by LSF's forces. Sneaking in, through their various tricks of deception, they walk the old streets of the ancient city. Glide towers rise from the city hundreds of feet into the air to ease the foot traffic of the mostly avian population and the newest among them still being hundreds of years old. The old town is an artisan town, as well as a center of strategic resources. It's clear why the city was occupied, rather than destroyed. Eventually, the party stops in a smithy. Three dragonborn in tech suits were harassing the smith, a handsome, 20-something avian by the name of Alaron. And on the way out, they name drop their commander, Chogger, a brief chat that foreshadows the boss to come. But, changing topic, the party discusses getting some custom work done for themselves, as well as helping the resistance, and finally, the topic of Saren. Alaron points the party in several directions to assist him in making those wishes happen, and hints at Saren's last known location as Tet's Spire, a dangerous mountain containing a blood altar to the old god Tet. The party decide to start their adventures in Tarsh with Theron Falls an old mine that became unused after a partial collapse. Within, the party finds a hole to the Underdark, a sound reason to abandon the mine, as well as mindless earth elementals endlessly mining. They conclude that once the monsters are cleared out, it would be safe to harvest what the elementals have mined up over the centuries. Further exploration of the caves led them to face to face with the Bahir, a truly astounding number of high rolls and seriously funny quasi threats to feed himself the Bahir, Donner befriends the draconic creature and he joins the party. You're welcome. I, like real talk though, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I know. I tried I tried so hard to explain everything that that entire session was, <laughs> and I just finally hit a point of fuck it. Uh, Sometimes reality is in fact funnier than than <laughs> fiction. It's true though. <laughs> the the details of that are so unimportant and so amazing. <laughs> right. It 
it, and that's that was the point I tried to make with with putting it that way. It doesn't matter the the crap that happened that session. It was a ton of high rolls and endless threats to feed yourself to him. <laughs> it was one, actually two, but still. <laughs> I still love that that was solved by like, wait, I can't talk draconic. Someone cast tongues on me, or <laughs> I cast tongues on myself, or something weird. Yeah. This someone couldn't speak draconic. I don't remember who it was. I Callie could not speak draconic. Oh, that's right. That's, she's like the only party member who can't just do it. Yeah. Oh, that was a that was a session. <laughs> that was a session. <laughs> That's one of our longer Chapter ones, two too. Continues to be the best that this campaign ever will be. Lillian can't oh, either. Man. Yeah, I knew one of you couldn't. The difference, though, is that Lillian didn't care about this conversation. Nope. <laughs> Lillian this was... gave, didn't give a shit. If I remember correctly, this was the first session we had. You had told us you're moving away from like. XP to milestone leveling. And this was the first episode, the first session that that came into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it had been. I had moved away at the end of chapter one. This was the point where you guys got your first level up off of that. Mm -hmm. I had decided. I had decided probably halfway through chapter one that. I was getting over keeping tra track of XP and keeping fights at certain XP values and doing all of that extra crap. And I just, I stopped caring because it made, it was making the game more about numbers on my end than it needed to. And I was starting to become afraid that that was translating to gameplay. Mm -hmm. I will say it wasn't affecting me. But the change away from it did make me stop seeing the numbers as any kind of important. Which, except because, HP, obviously. Yeah, what well, the numbers <laughs> of progress. Yeah. yeah. Which, good or bad, uh, in your perspective, is what I was trying to aim for. For me, on my end, it felt very much like most of my time went into planning for numbers. <laughs> And that felt less real. That felt very calculated. That felt like... You were the, maxing fights for us. Yeah. That felt like four, four, the campaign world was less important than the numbers. The numbers that it gave you, yeah. Okay. And I... Like, as soon as I realized that, I was like, we are going to finish out this chapter because I've already done the work, and then I'm bailing on this system entirely. Fair enough. I'm just letting you know that that, that change allowed me to make decisions that I did, which were in the same vein as Nora. Of, wait, I don't need to fight things if I don't have to, because experience doesn't matter. It's when Jet tells us to level up. Yeah. So that there, assisted there me... Have been to move away from any constraints of like just straight up fight everything you see basically <laughs> to, to gain power i didn't have to murder hobo mm -hmm. not that i was in that mindset my galley wasn't a character like that i'm not a player like that but it almost locked that entire line of things away which good or bad it it affected things and i don't I don't know if it's good or if it's bad, because this is really my first D&D campaign I've played beyond five sessions. Yeah. Um, the, the thing is, though, <laughs> is wrong. that the XP values are still more or less correct <laughs> for the levels. I The number of encounters you guys are getting, the XP that you would get from them, are within about 10% of the expected values anyways um but now i don't need to think about it and now you guys don't need to think about it and it's not a it isn't a value that we need to consider at any point in time which allows you guys to play the game as you would like if you mm -hmm. find a character that you hate you can kill it 
if I, you find I, a, a creature that you just want to turn into a god, <laughs> then I guess that's what you're doing now. See, I think instead of getting free XP, yep. I think half of that applies. The the going off the rails and just saying, "Hey, let's befriend something." That applies really well to this kind of system. Yeah. But the if I don't like a character, I can kill them. The incentive almost goes away with the um, milestone system because and... if I kill a character I don't like, I'm getting something. But if I just choose to kill a character with a milestone system, I'm just killing a character because I don't like them. So it's yeah. it's not a bad change. It definitely focuses more to narrative, but it's it's a very distinct change. Yeah. Because I remember that shift of wait, I don't have to fight things. Let's do something wacky to not fight. After how borderline murder hobo the party was at the end of chapter one i put the bahir in there thinking you guys These were gonna just be channel. like fuck it let's Hello. kill it were hey, we a murder hobo at the end we were chapter one ended with us in a war zone and enemies everywhere yeah like that was the but... last big encounter uh, yes but it was like i definitely felt that the party was just like there's no reason to talk to anyone that is clearly being labeled as an enemy. Just kill it. So I put the Bahir in there as, like, the, the you probably shouldn't fight this kind of thing. But I never <laughs> once expected you guys to go that extra step further and be like, let's talk to it. Why not? I, I, I understand your logic. I... I respect it because it led to some great things. Oh my but god. I, it I feel like changed. you are missing the context of yeah. we were sent to a place specifically to kill people and we killed everyone. Yeah. The only the only thing I can think of is the rats. We didn't attempt to circumvent the rats that were attacking us. Or that were everywhere. And then we ran into one were rat that we prevented. Then we went and yeah. fought a bunch of enemy soldiers. And then we met um, Reef. God, who... I can't believe that you have <laughs> a name for that still. All I rem The only reason I remember it's Reef is because like it's Refrandrel or something. And it sounds both Tolkien and it makes me think of uh, Churn. And we made the Kali Ma joke. Forgot about Cali Ma. I it, I can't believe I forgot that. Cause I, yeah. So that I just remember Reef because I'm like, okay, churn, underwater, uh, coral reef. Okay, got that. She met with Cali, Cali Ma, and that's basically all she ever did. But that's okay. <laughs> Nurak has a point. We exchanged murder hoboing for bipping yeah um, yeah we did i i kind of introduced that system so that you guys are allowed to just go beat the shit out of a a group of enemies that you know are there yeah you do need to kill them they there is no talking and also no one wants to deal with the the pains of combat for what is what, obviously enemies. trivial. Yeah. yeah. It I will say the the bipping system terribly unbalanced. I like there is no sense of like anything there, but it is a great power fantasy. Yeah. And that's, it's super that's all fun. it is. It <laughs> is the purpose it's super fun. of um the purpose of the bipping system is when I know that at most someone is going to burn like a second level spell slot and a different person is going to lose 6 HP and that is the extent of the damage done to the party and I'm just like fuck it but it's also important for the sake of still moving parts of the story along mm -hmm. um so all it really is is just giving you guys god power for yeah. the combat. It's glory. Let you guys yes. do, you know, have your moment. 
I I will say I liked the it, for a future reference, I liked the urn bips more than the okay, you come across the town and we're just gonna role play your way to center town. Yeah. I and those were fun, but they didn't have any kind of connection with the earned ones, the ones at the end of combat. It was okay, we've done rote combat for this squad of enemies, and then the last one or the last couple we can take out any remaining mm -hmm. energy we have on them. That's some good feedback. I've maybe not been doing a good job at keeping up with the earned bipping. It's okay. It's it's a thing that we tend to call for. We go, hey, can I? Yeah, yeah. it's like, especially once you got those dragon bone rings. Yes. Once, once we got those into a working position, those were a fun thing to use. Just because of how creative you can be with Hey, I have this tiny little, like, unbreakable object that I can shove with my entire force. Mm -hmm. It's a good time. I still yeah. think we should get a weapon that's like Yondu's little thing where it whistles <laughs> and flies around. That would be fun. That would be fun. That sounds like something an artificer should make. And, uh, you know, and a, the a only librarian. reason I haven't given that to you yet is I feel like no one in your party is of a class or disposition to use it. Fair enough. This is true. <laughs> now, if you were to give me one of those little uh, screaming drone tentacle things from Deimos, oh god, as Cali, <laughs> that sounds I would absolutely awful. Use that. <laughs> I that just give you awful. the uh, proboscis Cernos? Yes, yes, you can. <laughs> what? <laughs> so it's Probiscus a Cernos. It's a giant bow that shoots a pustule that then launches out proboscis onto nearby enemies, sucking them in and then exploding. Nice. <laughs> it's yeah. a little bit dumb without a without anything in it. No, uh, no reactor, no forma. It's one of my hardest hitting weapons. Nice. It's so dumb. That sounds really dumb. However, on at launch, it only had seven, uh, seven arrows in it. You only need one. It, you're not. You are not wrong. Hello, Crow. Welcome hey, to Crow. the show. Hello. <laughs> Okay, so we befriended the Bahir. Shall I continue? Yes. Quest complete, they head off west to deal with some raiders Aleron spoke of. A short travel to Swallowtail Glade, and the players find an encampment. Some discussion later, they find the raiders that they've been bypassing. Some discussion later, they find that the raiders they have been bypassing the occupied the occupying army's taxes of material goods by stealing shipments and selling them within the black market. An imperfect system, but one that had been keeping supplies out of the hands of the enemy. Several persuasion checks later, the party is able to convince the Blood Talon bandits to come work for the resistance. -na 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 -na. <laughs> it's his insert quest complete sounds here. <laughs> I, I actually expected you to just say insert quest complete sounds here, skipping the sound entirely. That's great. I, I, Wait, I try I to like... follow scripts as I read them. Did this write just completely it. ignore the titanium? Uh, titanium doesn't happen until after Tet dies, which is... Oh, yeah. Wait, why yeah. did we have to go get Nora? We had to go access the caves for something. Uh, you needed a supply route. Um, yeah, but what supplies were we getting in the cave? I'm trying to remember. Uh, it was gold, titanium, and... Oh, uh, that's right, because I wanted a tech suit. Yeah. yeah. I think, specifically, the resources in the cave are whatever Iron Man made his suit out of. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about I, right. Like that, that was a the extent of, of the research that I put into... <laughs> Wait, are we talking, like, suit? the very first Iron Man suit, or, like, his later versions? I don't remember. I just remember <laughs> looking up, like, what does Robert Downey Jr. say his suit is made of? And, uh, I was like, that's the shit in this cave! 
Oh, okay, yeah, titanium nice. alloy steel. And, okay, no, I I remember that scene. I think. Yeah. That was the entire extent of research I put into how to make a tight suit. How you doing, Chapter Look in the show. Oh, I see. You took the 13 off. Nice. Okay. The party turns north and treks deep into the mountains. Tet Spire is several hard days travel from the capital. During the climb, the party names the leader Nora Legong. The Bahir Nora Legong. Well, technically, at that point, kind of was leader? I don't even remember anymore. I mean, but... Kelly's always just leader. Right. Oh, yeah. There's... <laughs> y'all y'all didn't give me much chance to not be leader. Every party has has one person who's willing to step up. <laughs> Why do I have to be the leader and the face? <laughs> and the tank for half the, the game? <laughs> the only thing I didn't do is DPS, and even that changed. <laughs> Yeah, because Forge Cleric. <laughs> I'm not complaining about that part. <laughs> there, there because can't Forge be Cleric is busted. <laughs> Only because we needed the tank and Jet gave me those items early on and it was great. <laughs> that's, that's that's true. It is partially Jet's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Hence why Callie died. Yep. Entirely why Callie died. I will say, though, if, if you just wanted me to get rid of, like, the super opiate items, I probably would have done it if you would like introduce us to a to the B team and been like, "Hey, these guys are just starting out. You want to, you know, impart with them any wisdom of the ages?" Here, See, have my but... used underwear again. <laughs> exactly. Oh God! Okay, look, Callie's used underwear can tank mortar shots. Oh so... my God! Callie's used underwear may or may not be able to speak. Please also no. True. Please Don't no. Don't can't move Nobody on a shield butter? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Please no, not the shield butter again. The best part about that, it was actually just butter. It was butter. <laughs> there was nothing weird about it. There was nothing strange about it. It was normal cow butter. Still don't trust it. And that's your prerogative, I, and I don't blame you. I'm sorry, Crow, but I have to say I'm so glad that Odos is gone because I don't have to deal with weird cooking incidents. It's eventually. also true. Oh my god, I I can. I didn't know I had like a a thing, but I absolutely have like a weird food um phobia now. <laughs> Phobia. It was it was only red wine. <laughs> uh huh. Cherry almost wine. killed the party. Cherry <laughs> wine. Oh, that was that was hilarious though. I that is probably the greatest send off to Callie's tankiness we were ever gonna get. Yeah, I. I it's true. I needed to Fireball kill Callie for a number You're of right. reasons for the sake of giving you the opportunity to not be half of the things that you just listed. Yeah, fair enough. Um, which I felt I had to do to to call myself a decent DM. <laughs> um, as well as just, like, that was a really, really banger plot point. That was. A banger. Um, I never thought I'd hear you say that. <laughs> I say banger all the time. Do you? Dope AF. Fly AF. Plot point. We haven't gotten to that yet. Speaking we have not. Lying, it's in like okay. two sentences. Seriously, that's only two sentences? Okay, go yeah. for it. During the climb, the party names the Bahir Nora Legong. They find a treasure trove. Ryoko finds a time bending cloak, a minor retexturing of a cloak of stars. Nora dunks his head within the gold to become, quote, fly AF, unquote and emerges with a golden table bent around his head as a crown, as well as shutter shades. Cool. Cool. Atop the mountain, the party discovers signs of life in the form of a run-down cabin. 
and a bridge to its peak. At its peak stands the ruins of a temple, with signs of use recent rather than the thousands of years since it would have stood whole. Ryoko lifts the hood of his cloak and is transported into an ethereal temporal plane, where he sees the dais in front of him in use, a beam of light connecting it to the moon, Tet, small and distant directly above. The party decides to spend the night, waiting for moonrise. Near midnight, Tet, close enough to almost touch and large beyond measure, rises on the horizon. Hours later, in the earliest hours of the morning, Tet reaches its zenith and a beam appears. Jet, you want to take over from here? Yeah. So, the the truth here is that I tried to condense what happens next into a couple of sentences. And honestly, this might be the best that I have written for this campaign yet. And I could not find a way to do it justice in a few short sentences. So I basically left a note for Vlas. I'm not doing that. Tell me to read. <laughs> it says death of the youngest dot txt here. <laughs> yeah. We'll get we'll get to the reason it's named that here at the end of this recap as well. Um so I'm just going to go ahead and start at um at you guys spending the night. Um I have in brackets if going to Tet, and brackets, you spend the night in the cold watching the horizon for the moon rise. Around midnight, a massive form breaks the horizon. It will be several hours before Tet reaches its zenith, but it seems almost close enough to touch as it is already. The beams appear and entwine, Tet above you, seeming close enough now to make you think that if you could only jump a little higher, gravity itself would reverse and send you hurtling towards the moon's surface. A moment or an age later, you find yourself standing on the stone dais that you left, but looking out over the dusty pink surface of Tet. All across your field of view, there lies massive bones, thousands of creatures long dead. More brackets. If Ryoko goes to the astral plane, you step back into the astral plane and are teleported to your exact location in a parallel world of ink and shadow. Around you lie massive dragons, their breathing either ceased or labored, the dying struggling to find a final resting place among the dead. You notice a small whelpling struggling against its coming death. It suddenly sneezes, a rocket of blood and flame and jets it a foot backwards, and it hits the ground with a splurge. Its limp body no longer breathing as its eyes search into your soul before it succumbs to some unknown plague. A pair of ghostly arms race from your abdomen as you realize the whelp wasn't staring at you, but a form where you stand. And as you step back to take a look, you re re-enter the material plane amongst the bones. Dragon bones. Every single skeleton that you come across is that of a dragon. The sound of rolling thunder echoes across the vast empty emptiness of the moon, followed by a shudder, and the beam of light leading back to your world flickers. The shudder is followed by a violent tearing sound reverberating through the moon, and you are thrown to the ground by the subsequent quake. Touching the beam of light, you feel yourselves sucked into a vortex and thrown across space and time. <sighs> Images and ideas pass through your minds at the speed of infinity, and madness seeps into the creeping edges of your mind. Then it stops, and the top of the mountain comes into view several hundred feet below. Inches from the ground, you come to a jarring stop, an impossibly loud sound without compare explodes into the back of your mind, or perhaps it's just above you. And as soon as you come to terms with that thought, another tearing sound, like that of mountains crumbling, follows. And in the pre-dawn sky, Tet splits. Tet 
the youngest of the moons in the sky begins to crumble to dust, borne on the winds of the upper atmosphere, and you watch in horror as you harmlessly fall that last inch to the cold stone. An hour passes while you stare into the heavens, and with one last cloud of pink dust thrown by the wind, Tet passes from existence and is no more. Behind you, the sound of deep sobbing wakes you from the nightmare that you have witnessed. And yet, when you turn to look, all you see is shifting snow and a fine layer of pink dust. Fuck, man. And was this, was this Still... the part where Cam cried? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I thought so. I don't blame him. Like, that hurts. I wrote something that physically hurts me to read through. This is why I told you, fuck it, I'm not condensing yeah. it. Like, there is no condensing that. No. You can't really condense that and still get the same effect. No, it... Cam literally took a lap around his house. That was... Yep. I am not sure if it is the the context I heard it, the night it was that I first heard it, or what. But that that's weirdly untouching to me. So it's very strange to have you guys go like that was super emotional, and like I don't I don't feel that for some reason. It was definitely the context. Like I nearly cried while reading it in context that night. That was very emotional. Um. That is condensed. There isn't any of the role play in between all of that. This is just my flat notes mm -hmm. with the uh, where the pauses were are line breaks to let you guys do stuff without the context of the stuff that you guys did. It definitely isn't as hard hitting. No, I mean, like on the same night, I didn't have the emotional hit mm -hmm. that you and Cam go through, and that's disconcerting to me as a person because I feel like I should have that emotional hit. I mean, to be fair, I don't either. But I get where if somebody had the right context, they would feel it. So, I'm not it's not bad writing by any stretch. It's not it's not anything no, injected. It's, it's just It's it's literally me as yeah. someone interpreting what I'm hearing. It's weird to me that I am not feeling the emotion that is being presented. I mean, it's powerful, but it's not like tear jerker to me. So hearing it, hearing it the second time and the baby dragon that catches me, but that's just because that is something I can empathize with. Mm -hmm. That's a, a baby of any species being sad and literally coughing its last breath out at you. Right. That's, <laughs> I, I understand that being impactful. Yeah, to be fair to Cam, I did, like, put a baby dragon to its death in front of him and more or less call him out by name with it, so... It's true, you did. Yeah, he's the only one who actually saw that in character. So, and I have absolutely continue to do shit like that with him in the ethereal plane. They've just been emotionally yeah. numb for years. I mean, kinda same. That's not healthy, and I also have never hated something more that I 100% agree with. <laughs> I do try not to be emotionally dead, and it's just... Hard to break that. <laughs> I'm glad my memes survive in my in in you. <laughs> Not even in my community, just straight up in you. You shall be the You're keeper welcome. of records, Plastilian. <laughs> Long after I am gone, you shall remember my memes. Yeah, right. I'm like Jet's meme archivist. I yes. hate that. <laughs> that was the day that I obtained a bunch of one-of-a-kind dragon bones. 
It's true, you did. And did then I you did. made them into armor. I did. I did. I was in a Skyrim kick that week. That I remember that discussion. Who asked the librarian <laughs> keeper of memes? I mean, isn't that essentially what Donar is at this point? Well, he is uh, a librarian. Exactly. And, and the keeper of the party memes. Exactly. I think Donar just is the party memes. They're I mean, all also Donar true. Based. He doesn't have to keep them, he just has to be there to be the meme. To be fair, it, every single one of the Donar memes is Donar's fault. It's also true. This is true. <laughs> and I hate if it, you, but it's true. If you don't like the outside world, then fuck it, you can eat me. Yep. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> that could be taken out of context. No, oh my. No. That's the the out of context is the context that was used. Don't know the living meme. Yep. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm only, <laughs> only pay, half a paying attention to the to the conversation because I'm just uh, getting myself some uh, dinner ready and then just <laughs> that, that chimed me back into the conversation. Of so course, that's lost. what drove you back in. <laughs> <laughs> the the short version crow is that was the day that the party acquired one Bahir named Nora. Yep. That we turned into a god. Yep. Ah. That Nora ref that uh, Otos refuses to acknowledge. Oh yeah, that's the that's the god of feasting, isn't it? Yep. 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 God of the feast. Why are there so many like eating related? Uh, mostly because <laughs> we're. One, we are almost always hungry. <laughs> Two, yep. they are actually kind of connected. It's true, they are. And three, the gods of this world are being created by the party. So really, it's not a, a view into my world as much as it's a view into the brains of your party members. <laughs> hey, I'm also just gonna, true. I'm just going to point out... We should out... probably stop going to sessions hungry then. <laughs> no, we shouldn't. It's too good. <laughs> Mostly because it got one of the best sermons I have ever given that was completely ad-libbed. Oh yeah, that was. Blast wouldn't address a crowd. Nope. So it's Donna Callie, does not do well with crowds. Callie disguised herself as a male tiefling and gave a sermon of the Church of the Promised Meal and it started everything. Yep. <laughs> I. Uh, that's it. I just. I. We've killed the DM. Sure Congratulations. I love. I forget how Cal even disguised herself. Was it a spell or like did she have items? I think it was items. Because in my head, it's literally just Callie with like a mop strapped to her face as a beard. Ooh, she's Sokka? Basically. <laughs> <laughs> this, this beard is currently glued to my face. Or permanently, permanently glued to my face. But no, that was a great session. DM is dead again? Yeah, right. <laughs> we haven't killed the DM in a while. <laughs> Meanwhile, <sighs> back at the cabin... They find Saren, a barely 20-year-old avian of snow-white feathers, sobbing. He is completely inconsolable and unable to function, so the party dismisses themselves and begin to make their return journey. A blizzard kicks up, forcing them to make shelter along the path. The snow falls heavily in large pink crystals as the remains of Tet begin to accumulate in the atmosphere. Tremors begin to moan within the earth. For hours, the tremors continue below the surface, until they abruptly stop. Moments later, the party is attacked by purple worms, malformed and deranged, with large pink crystalline growths protruding from their bodies. Saren.txt here. Yeah, I'm just going to read this out as well, because this is um, one of the most important parts of um, of the campaign. This, this is... Um, Saren delivering you guys the prophecy. And I figured instead of, you know, shortening the, pro the prophecy, I'm 
let's just read that out loud again. Um, and it's also, you know, the introduction of my boy. Um, where is it? There we go. Um, as the creatures prepare to start, have head, have head, head. Too many S's. Uh, as the creature prepares to strike you, the sound of crackling ice and uh, envelops the mountainside, and the creature slows, stops, and finally says, "Hep, hep, hep," and finally succumbs to its icy fate as it becomes a sculpture. The crackling continues for a moment as the remaining creatures join their kin as a permanent fixture within the mountain path. The avian, his feathers almost, his features, Jesus. How did I get through Tet as well as I did? And I can't barely get through five words right now. Who knows? <laughs> the avian... His <laughs> no. features almost childlike now that he has recovered, Amen. turns stoic as he steps across the top of the snow with his feather-like fingers clasped together in front of him. He releases his grip and diamond dust scatters into the wind. As he approaches, his other hand reaches into his bag to produce a fist-sized orb, which he rolls across the snow and into the center of the party. A voice booms from the device, and a psychic image screams into the into your brains. An old, ancient bird, white feathers tipped with blue speaks. Be warned, for the age of the dragon approaches, and doom shall follow upon swift wings of blue. Beware the star child, for she is the herald of this world's true demise, and of the death of the youngest, whose passing will signal the start of the end. This prophecy I pass unto myself, Saren Frostfeather, as my final act of this l lifetime. I think you guys only ever received, um, when, when you got the hint at the prophecy, I think you guys only received the Age of Dragon and the Star Child. I don't know that I actually informed you guys of the death of the youngest the first time. I think you mentioned it later on. Or some, 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 you mentioned it sometime later on. I don't remember when. The prophecy? I stuck there for a second. Yeah. Um, I think the first time I gave you guys the prophecy, I only gave you. Um, the Edge of Dragon and the Star Child. I don't think I gave you uh, Wings of Blue or um, Death of the Youngest. Prophecy is one of the things I've not kept good track of. I consistently forget what each thing references because I think we've run into all of it already. Um, well, I, I'm not asking for spoilers there. Yeah. I just... um... Under the assumption that I didn't give you guys the death of the youngest previously to this, um, I killed Tet before revealing that that was part of the prophecy. I mean, same also... session, but I definitely killed Tet prior to informing you that that was part of the prophecy. Yeah. Um, Wings of Blue is always the one I'm most confused about. Most of it's just kind of events that happen in large RP, but that's that's the hardest because I don't pay attention to colors of characters very often. Saren's white, but that's about yeah. it. Uh, I, I will tell you that you have not seen that yet. Okay. I will also tell you that I have Rock. begun uh, writing for that reveal, and uh, holy fuck. <laughs> I expect these last two chapters of this campaign to, um, to be on par with chapter two, if not better. Okay.
having these couple of weeks off um, is a world of difference. I like as much as I enjoy playing this campaign, um, I only get like six months worth of writing done like during the year I get most of my writing done over this Christmas break. Uh, so yeah, that's the end of, of that prophecy. If you want to keep on going class. The party has acquired one sad boy. I don't There's... care if you read this or not. Okay. Um, uh, if if you would rather me read it because you, it's... you can because it is your okay. your thing. Yeah. So I put in a DM note here. Um, I just want to I want to mention that most of this story uh, came about from adventures with uh, these characters. Um, I had these four characters that make up my main cast. Um, and I built them out of my own and some willing friends' um, personal mental uh, problems, um, disabilities, um, fears, what what have you. Um, Cass is anger, poor anger management, um, an inability to maintain control. Um, and while she hasn't really shown that off, I'll get to why. Um, Shock's different forms reflect upon multiple personalities. Uh, Garish is my ADHD, and Saren is my autism. Um, the story was, the original story was to reflect upon daily life under these stresses, uh, and the war outside was an attempt at a metaphor for the war within. Obviously, as a campaign centering itself around characters that are not this main cast, um, much of this has been lost in translation as well as outright removed for the sake of not getting to... I have a note in here for if Vlas read this. Simply says, Sicilian hand-waving. <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd rather discuss most of this out of character. It would have been fine as a book. It would have been fine under most other circumstances, but it feels a little too self-serving to perform and play it. That said, these characters do attempt to reflect some real emotions and real issues. Um, I have only tried to make them slightly more fanciful so as to not personally feel like I'm playing myself or portraying one of my friends, or otherwise. It feels a little weird when you are just talking about yourself, sort of in character, User but joined you your channel. know that it's exclusively Hello. you. So, I just want to mention that here, now that we're at the full main cast. Um, because I have absolutely abandoned some of those plot points for the sake of not getting into personal shit. Hello. Hey. Hello, user. I think I will be able to pull off a little bit of cast um, here towards the end. Um, I think I get a chance to do some of that without feeling self-serving. Um, but, I mean, I even changed Garish's name very early on in this campaign, or at least reference to Garish, um, because it started feeling a little too real. So, B 
bit if of you want to continue but... glass <laughs> yeah it's a long silent journey back to Eladrin. Saren is completely unaccustomed to people in general let alone speaking with them the party resume their disguises and head back to Alan's shop to inform them of their work. When he realizes that Saren has returned with them, he reveals himself as the last of the Thunderhawks, a sect of specialized warriors that would have been Saren's personal guard, and the only other remaining pure-blood phoenix. The party returns to base with the new recruits, and Saren casts Wish to restore Garish. Rested and with a sizable army to back them, Resistance leadership suggests it's time to take the fight to the enemy. Targeting the Tarshani complex, the party is to infiltrate and destroy the reactor, shutting down its experimentation and freeing those imprisoned and enslaved within. However, the party is ambushed by a single enemy, a special forces assassin, poisoned, paralyzed, and taken. The players find themselves imprisoned within the complex days later with their belongings having been confiscated, cuffed to the walls of their cells. Callie uses the magical rings that she had hidden, breaks her bonds as well as the door, and allows her party members to escape. They proceed through the base, tearing up the place, and finally running into their leaders as well as Chogger. Cass loses a leg. We are introduced to another persona within shock. The players kill Chogger, rescue the prisoners, and set the reactor to explode. Scientific yeet dot mp4. <laughs> um, exclamation yeet in the chat. <laughs> I couldn't remember what the command was off the top of my head, yeah. so I just made something close enough. Having loosened LSF's grip on the area, the party returns to Eldrin to find its citizens fighting off its occupiers, and with the assistance of the party, the city is reclaimed, a fire burning in the souls of the people who had been repressed for a third of a century. End chapter 2. Chapter 2 was absolutely just good. It I was. enjoyed chapter 2 more than I think anything else. A lot happened for sure. Oh, it did. It totally that did. That was. That was such a short chapter that only took a few months. That was like four months. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was short. You guys got so much shit done. Yeah. In between all the bullshitting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got both the shit and the bullshitting done. Right. And can we can we can we discuss uh, how Kelly or not Kelly uh, Lillian hamstring thirty six people on the way out of the <laughs> yeah, complex? I, I decided not to include that because it wasn't uh, important to the um, to the, <laughs> the recap. Plot. It's important to us <clears throat> as people who went through that. And that's how Lillian almost got an alignment change. <laughs> that is how Murak. Learn to never let Chris roll for the victim total. <laughs> the, it, regardless of the number of people that were hamstrung, like the the action alone was definitely worthy of me going. Hmm, <clears throat> that feels alignmenty. Right. Uh, uh, uh huh. If I remember correctly, <laughs> the same session was also where I definitely let, or the same arc was definitely where I let. Callie get like her darkest unquestionably maybe because that was the jailbreak yeah. oh yeah oh yeah Callie, Callie got Callie got a wild hair up her ass and... oh yeah was that and, yeah that was yeah. also the same place I almost made uh I made Jet uh gag during one of the bips I had oh at least yeah. once at least once <laughs> I think I actually made you stop doing bips. Hey, just because I threw a guy into the gears of a conveyor belt doesn't mean it was a bad thing. Stop. <laughs> That's what happened. God damn it. I forgot about that. Bad. <laughs> hey, that's also where I met the, the only legally binding 
wife I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that too. I didn't. It's in my notes. Oh my god. I oh, forgot amazing. that entirely. What? <laughs> so one of the many guards that I bit that you you were too busy throwing up to remember most of them because they just kind of kept mm -hmm. they, they kept the same general level of like I make someone regret being alive. So one of them who refused to give me any information on the field, like ones who gave me information I would like just kill in horrible ways, but not like horrifying ways, you know. That one like did the whole I'd rather die thing. So I threatened them by saying I would skin them alive, wear their skin, and go raise their child as my own. Oh, yeah, I that one. That. I so remember I that now. Them, and I have, by and large, not canonically kept that promise, but I have kept that promise. I remember that now. I still say at the end of this, when Jet closes it and we're done the title of this campaign is going to be how i hated my party yeah right <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah that was one of the many bits that just kind of blended together there were a lot of really messy bits in that place there were there really were but uh that Chapter 2 was when the legend of the party really started taking off as like you don't you don't have to like them but they're definitely saving you from something that you're kind of sure is worse and if you're against them well you may not want to fight them you you definitely understand the things they've done to people you probably know Right. <laughs> you're not people to cross but at the moment they're on your side so you're kind of okay with them <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that I have managed to pull events together since then to mellow this party out just a hair. Yeah, we were pretty damn brutal back then. <laughs> Speaking of fucking murder hoboing. <sighs> there were a number of events where I, like, I can't speak for anybody else, but I literally ch triggered, like, personality changes in Lillian and whatnot from what was happening and all that. Outside of raging, yeah. That is a character flaw that I can't deal with yet. yet. I don't know why I haven't, like, forced you to take a level of barbarian yet. You have. Did I? Uh-huh. Okay. I have one level of barbarian because of that, yeah. Right, I finally did that. That was your special level up. Correct, yeah. <sighs> <laughs> I finally just did that thing. Oh, no, I made the Lillian joke that I could rage been, while I'm raging. Yeah, Lillian has been a thorn in my side since day one with her temper. And yet, you are the one that let it happen. <laughs> oh, yes, I absolutely have. It's just... If I recall, it's, it's not I had a this it's idea a... for a character, and you went, "That that's really neat. Do it." Yeah. That, that was about the gist of it. It's it's not that it's a complaint. It's just that it has become a daily thing that I have to remind myself of every time I sit down to write notes. Yeah, yeah. Lillian's just gonna rage on shit. Do I? bother putting notes in for this character or am i going to end up with a raging cat girl in in three sentences and then not need any of this background information lillian i choose you <laughs> <laughs> i remember that that happened once chris yeah, threw me at the boss <laughs> that was the that was the next chapter wasn't it <laughs> chapter three that it's... might have been chapter three. It was such a side event when it happened. It's hilarious, though. It was. Yeah. Like, oh, we need to kill this thing. Okay, piss Lillian off, pick her up, and No, that was when you it. were already, like, raging out of control, and we had to, like, restrain you just to go anywhere. Normally, Callie would pick me up and put me at arm's length and let me beat on her shield. 
Lillian's personal storyline quest <laughs> mostly involved Lillian not being conscious. Yeah, it's true. It's so yeah. true. It's okay. We're we're coming up on Vlas's storyline quest. Oh god. And at least <laughs> one member of this party I have told a, a few secrets to. I uh I've had fun writing for this. I'm sure you have. <laughs> you get to write Vlas a storyline for the living meme. You. <laughs> it is not because it's you. It's because everything that you have given me. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it better be damn good. <laughs> I I suspect you'll actually really enjoy this once you get over once you get over it. Please getting don't over it? Really like no, I don't want to play that game. Check or something. Oh, uh, Anything to do with Rolashek would have been too easy. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> are, you, are you being a lovey kitty now? Can I... Chris, you're the one I told. Can I get away with spoiling a bare minimum context, or is that giving too much away? A bare minimum context of... Uh... The oncoming Vlast story that you have already yes. given? <sighs> I would say no. Just to preserve integrity or whatever you I, guys call it. Oh, hold on, I have to do this in text because you asked me a question that requires subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But do you want to say hi? It's hello. Do you want to say hello? Or are you just going to meow at me? Nope, I think they say screw the camera. Pardon my messy ass room, but that, that's my cat. That's sure a good hello, cat. kitty. That R2. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's R2. Okay. Yeah, um, I can get away with dropping this. Uh, Vlas, your personal quest is the main quest. Of course. <laughs> it's crystallized all over again. Just wait till Ascension. <laughs> to be fair, though, Vlas, <laughs> you gave me a character who is a traitor. You it's are true, coming up on the end of the campaign, and I haven't actually done anything with that yet, besides harass you. It's true. It's coming. Mm -hmm. What? 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 So, yeah, uh, this has been a lot of fun writing for that, because um, I've kind of Everyone else's backstory had enough to it that, um, like, they've had input. You <clears throat> don't really, you didn't give me all that much. You gave me, like, a couple of names. You gave me a, um, you gave me that you had a family. You gave me that you stole an item, and that's how you got out. That's it. Yeah. So I've been allowed to... The creative freedom, go for it. Yeah, I've been allowed to have creative freedom on that, which is giving me the ability to write like an entire chapter almost exclusively based on your backstory. Nice. Instead of having these little side quests, your backstory is the main story here. Cool. <laughs> I guess further spoilers, it's Joran, as you guys have already been informed. So Yeah, um 
I am looking forward to getting that ball rolling, though. It's going to be interesting. Are there any questions regarding Chapter 2? Um, anything that I skipped out on that you guys want to talk about? Because I definitely left a few things out. I left out um, Nurak, your second character. What are you doing back there? Ding dong. Crow, do you have any questions regarding Chapter 2 since you came in hella late into this campaign? Uh, not particularly, because I guess biggest thing is I wasn't there for <laughs> pretty much all of it. Alright, well, that's all I have. So, Flas, you got anything else you want to add? Nope, I think I'm good. Alright. And before Donar becomes Tony Stark, I mean... <laughs> I mean, you're six chapters behind there, bud. Yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> my my five-word thing is faux Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> and books, but yeah. Yeah, I was, I was talking about the corporation and everything else that goes oh. along with it, though. Dark Industries? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Donar Incorporated. Oh no. <laughs> we, we deal oh, exclusively no. in food related technology. Oh no. <laughs> I have ideas for, for campaign two now. Oh no. <laughs> Please don't make me become the evil corporation. Uh Donar oh, is my job. Donar is Aramark. <laughs> oh no. CEO of Promised Inc. Please, say, in, in, in campaign two, can we please have Cali Corp? I was gonna say, Cali Corp was literally invented for <laughs> right for season two. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, I'm still trying to figure out how I want to do season two because I've already put things in place in this campaign that are going to come back for season two. Um, and I'm that's that's the only spoiler you're getting on that. Um, but I haven't decided the time frame yet, and I want it to be a a fair amount of time, but I don't know that I can. So I'm trying to decide, like, what stage in life the campaign one party is going to be at. I don't know. One eternity later. <coughs> Two eternities later. I mean, realistically, like, how much trouble can Callie get into unchecked for ten years? Probably Do you really want to answer that question? <laughs> Please don't actually answer that, because <laughs> I, I'm going to have to hard veto it for the sake of my world. For the sake of having a world left right. to give you guys a campaign to you win. Out? My silence is the worst answer you will ever receive. Sounds about I right. Hate it. I hate it. I have been teaching myself how to write drum parts for drum and bass for the last three days, and I have eight measures of music to show for that. Nice. Boots and pants. Boots and pants and boots and pants and boots and pants. <laughs> boots and cats and boots and cats. That's how I learned it. Boots and cats. Yeah. 
the I just learned it the uh, the Skrillex way, which is sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Something, something, the um, claptrap way. Yes. Directive three, dance. No, no, cancel directive three. <laughs> Commencing directive three. Oh god. Okay. The work has commenced, so I will be out. Peace. Peace. You are disconnected from your channel. <clears throat>
It was very bad. <laughs> Lots of drinking at the time. <laughs> that, that that didn't help. But well, see, there you go. It was alcohol <laughs> impeded. You gotta try again sober. Nope. <laughs> I already know I wouldn't do any better sober. Oh, ye of little faith. Sober Bashi Wen. God damn it. <laughs> huh, this. If I get to 25 subs, I will do Sober Bashi. That also unlocks the next emote sub? slot. 25. But it's only how, a half how hour. Do I sub. <laughs> but it's only it's only a half hour. Don't you put that evil on us. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> and I'm only I'm limiting it to a half hour though. I'm not doing a full stream of that. <clears throat> if that if I get twenty five subs, I'll also get a fourth emote, so I'll get someone working on that. Nice. I've already thrown my sub at you. So. I know you have. <clears throat> I don't know what to do now. I know some people wanted, uh, in Silver's server, wanted to do Jackbox, but I don't even know if they're online right now. Awesome. Why is that keep happening? <laughs> I really just want to take that Twitch global emote and just put a circle with a cross on it. <laughs> but no, I won't do that. Because then they'll get me for infringement or some shit. Probably. Oh, did you hear about Twitch's new TOS? Uh, probably not. It's very weird. Uh, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not gonna go into it. Uh, look it up if you're interested. There are some words that are now bannable offenses. That oh, yeah? are just why. Like I'm not. I'm not gonna say them because bannable offense. But just look it up. <laughs> it's very very odd like uh mainstream internet words are now bannable oh, offenses it's, I see. it's weird yeah you see what i mean now like twitter was blowing up about it the other day i feel like the only people who would use those words are really stupid i mean you're with. you're you're not wrong <clears throat> but i mean uh, Panzer, one of my friends on here, one of the people he follows, actually has an emote using one of those words. So <laughs> the Whoops. emote, any emotes that use those words are going to be gone too. They're like they're going to be uh, rejected now. So, eh, just the same. It, it doesn't doesn't bother me at all. <clears throat> it's just weird that they would choose now of all times to do that. Like, why why wouldn't you've done it? Before now, you know? because the very loud mi mi minority, pretty much. Very true. <clears throat> what gets things done nowadays? Ignore the majority and pander to the loudest. Uh huh. Kate, pander to the ones with the most money. That's what. That's basically what they're doing. Who Who's giving me the most money? Oh, it's these guys. Okay, I'll listen to them. You know. Remind me of a, uh, there was a comic book store who literally, the owner, she literally said, I won't say exactly what she said because it's bannable on Twitch, but in short, if you are a white male, she doesn't want to do business with you. Wow. In no uncertain terms. Wow. Okay. <laughs> And so they stopped doing business with her. And two months later, she went bankrupt, went out of business, and then blamed the white man. Oh, my it. God. <laughs> That's I... ridiculous. 
I, I don't know how she opened a business in the first place. Uh, also that. <laughs> I have no idea. It was all over some guy. He was going and he went in there to get some certain, I forget what it was, by some artist she really didn't like and she blew up and threw him out and it just blew up from there. Wow. <laughs> the uh, the quartering has a whole video series on it if you actually care to know more. There's just things I can't talk about on Twitch about it because it gets pretty, pretty nasty. Yeah. But I think I'm going to end stream for now. If we do do Jackbox, I will hop back in or I'll just host it in my Discord server. If you're not part of my Discord server, go ahead and join. Um, shameless self-plug, even though it is my own channel. Oh, thank you, Nerok. But I am going to end the stream here. Thank you all for hanging out. We do appreciate it. Um, we'll be back uh, soon-ish. Probably after the holidays with more. We'll be back after the holidays with more D and D. Um, starting our next chapter. What are we on? Chapter six now? Seven? I don't. I don't exactly remember. Shame of self plugging your own channel. Isn't that just good branding? Fair point. Chapter <laughs> six. Okay. Um. Yeah. If we do do Jackbox, I'll post it in the server. But thank y'all for hanging out. I hope everyone here has a good night. I'll see you later. See everybody. Stay tuned for Bashi. No Bashi.